up, everyone? Welcome to Cannabis and Soil Research, a new show where I am your host. So I'm going to do things a little bit differently with this show. Um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to have like rotating co-hosts where we bring on different talented people, consultants who are very skilled in like a niche area of cannabis cultivation and soil sciences. And each week, every Sunday at 420, we talk about a very specific research paper, something cutting edge, um, specific to that person's specialties. And then we discuss it. Um, we talk about, you know, the implications um, and also like some experiments maybe that we're working on or that we can implement from the research that we're discussing. Uh, this week, we have Kevin Jodry. Thank you so much for being on here. Thank you for having you're me mute, Kevin. Yeah, thank you so much. So, how are you doing? What are you working on? You got anything cool going on? I do. I got a bunch of cool shit going on. I'm uh, working on a couple of different breeding projects, and I'm working on integrating a bunch of uh, genetics from Afghanistan, Pakistan, into some of the modern hash cultivars so we can improve profiles. It, we're, we're kind of bottlenecked in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And we've also done so much work from indoor centric operations that we've lost natural resiliency. And so if I can, if I can take some of the plants that I've worked with from those regions that have just, I want to say just tougher and they have profiles that we we just don't have in our gene pool anymore to really work with. It, it's fun. So I did some R and D, you know, a year ago and I pulled out some crazy stuff. And so I was really happy. So I know the direction's good. And I'm just really excited about a lot of that stuff. Um, you know, there's like the industry that's that, that, that you're in the industry. And then there's you, the, you know, like cannabis crafts person. And the craft stuff is always more interesting because it's you chasing your desire the industry shit is what pays the bills and sends you, you know, into the world of um, larger infrastructure. So they're both really cool in the way they're cool, but like the weird little fringe shit that I like to do, uh, that's that's what I'm stoked about. Nice. Yeah, I like doing the, the weird little fringe things. I got some different kind of experiments and concoctions that I've been playing with and working on. Um, people who know me know that I'm really big into biology, into fermentation, into like... Uh, bacteria and the specific effects that it has on cannabis. Um, and I know a big thing right now is talking about secondary metabolite production mm -hmm. um, and integrating different species of bacteria and fungi to promote secondary metabolites, um, your aromas, your thiols, your phenols, your esters, um, to really get like a unique product. Um, and so that's what we're talking about today. That's the research paper that I sent over. Um, I know you got a chance to look at it. What did you think of it? It was fascinating. And you know, the thing is that if you've been in, if you've been in cannabis for a long time and you've, you've worked a lot of different directions, you start to notice natural patterns emerge and you start to notice that diversity always comes out as diversity in consumptive. And so mm -hmm. the, the more things I have to work with as a factory that the plant can mine and utilize, the more differentiation I get. And when I did a lot of R and D prior, I got to measure these things. And so to me, it's just epic that you continuously have new science being, you know, broken down and to help us understand, you know, maybe how to identify what types of bacteria and fungi are needed to create certain levels of metabolite production. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the, and I know that this is the, the 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 emerging world we're in years ago because you had, I think there was a company, uh, I want to say one of the large uh, genetics companies, agricultural companies, but they purchased a, a bacteria business in Israel for like 600 million. And it was about really patenting and controlling microbes that have been chosen and selected to do certain things. And so when I saw that occur, I just knew that we had barely scratched anything on this because mm -hmm. that investment was so massive that I realized that that's probably our next, you know, frontier is to really understand how do we work with the, the consortium, the microbial herd and mm -hmm. be able to actually, you know, use it in a positive way. And I, I've, you know, I got to meet some people locally in Humboldt 
um, T Lab Luke, and he had done a, a, a harvest and had multiplied bacteria that had given him greater FOSS uptake. And so he would he would be able to sell you bags of this product, and then you'd be able to brew it with the with the the idea that we're going to get you know higher FOSS uptake. And the only way we would really know is if we were able to you know do a control and a non-control and measure, but the point is that you already see people, you know, going into the science and pulling out information and then trying to utilize it. And we just need to be able to have scientific proof, so to speak, so we can really say, hey, does it have a, an impact or does it not? Does it just make us feel good? Because sometimes mm -hmm. feeling good is important as a cultivator, too. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know and, I mean? and it's like, important for people to know that that anyone can can do these things like we can culture different species of bacteria that we can introduce into our gardens to promote very specific um, outcomes like phosphorus solubilization. Um, that's actually something recently that I've been playing with um, is taking species of phosphorus solubilizing bacteria, um, introducing the enzymes specific to those species, as well as a phosphorus source into a barrel um, and letting it ferment over time and then introducing it to my plants. Um, I've been watching a lot of that stuff. You see, I think that you're probably, in my opinion, I would say you're the most cutting edge person I know in this in, in this field. No, it's true. <laughs> it's just that what you're doing is you're you're not afraid to dive all the way to the bottom mm -hmm. and you're you're constantly, you know, bringing this information out. And but what you do is you present it in a really easy to understand way because you have to have people that are in the fringe. I live in my fringe, right? And so what it does, it lets people tap into what where my mind spends its time. And then what I get to do is I get to check out your work. And I was just fascinated with some of the way you were doing fermentations of specific um, plant material to drive specific uptakes. And it was just such a, um, a thought out process that it was it was awesome because I want to be able to develop these abilities in my own life. And so to be able to see how you're approaching it lets me realize, hey, I could start here with this and I could work towards a goal. And it's uh, it's 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 incredible. The, the world of uh, biologically driven plant is is just beginning for us because we went through the chemical warfare for so long literally scratching the surface right yeah yeah we really don't know anything and i admit that all the time yeah. i'm not a soil scientist i do yeah. the best i can to understand what i need so that i can get good results from my crops but when you're spread out you have to be able to make it work for you as well and so you do it in a, in a more simple method but you know the ability to be able to to create a, a driven system like the ones that you work on to me it's just you know it's the the culmination of of craft and science together and i i see it through you mostly because you present it but i meet a lot of cultivators in the u.s now that are you know fully biologically driven ferment driven and at a, at a two three four you know light level small outdoor patch level so mm -hmm. the the change is here. You're seeing the new growers coming in, adopting those methodologies, because at the end of the day, what they're getting is better product in the mouth, in in their opinion. 100%. And, you know, I, I try to encourage people to, to think outside the box and to, like, integrate different mm -hmm. methods, um, different, you know, uh, food sources for microbes, you know, polyphenols, polysaccharides, um, to kind of tailor or encourage specific growth of, like, bacteria that feeds on those specific food sources. Um, and to use like things native to your surroundings. So like integrate mm -hmm. what's cultivating around you, like your natural, uh, you know, plant life uh, to create a topographically unique product. Because as our soil compositions are different, we're going to have different genetic expression um, slightly, you know, we'll have a topographically unique terroir, right? Um, mm -hmm. In our cannabis from integrating, you know, just having a unique approach to our cultivation practices and our unique uh, light spectrum and soil composition and amendments that we use. And that kind of leads us into our conversation on uh, the research paper, because mm -hmm. um, they're talking a lot about specific profiles of biology in the soil and how it affects the specific expression of these secondary metabolites, as well as they mentioned um, uh, topographically unique endophytes and how mm -hmm. they create different expressions in the cannabis plant. So not only are we seeing light spectrums that create 
you know, Terroir, but we're also seeing local endophytes that are specific to that region that are also creating a new expression as well. And they're talking about identifying, isolating, culturing, um, and introducing them. Um, but they're also talking about the potential for uh, native biology to compete with some of these ideal microbes, which I found was interesting um, because they're almost saying that some are like superior to others and that we may not want a lot of the different biology or constantly introducing different biology that isn't gonna be beneficial to secondary metabolite production. And it might be better to uh, like isolate, find them through DNA sequencing, multiply them and then introduce them specifically. Um, which I thought was kind of interesting because um, so many people, we do things like putrefication of plant matter, like in a Judean liquid fertilizer, or we do an aerobic compost tea or an anaerobic fermentation. Um, and we don't really know like exactly what species are in there based on whatever inoculant source that we're using. And we could be interrupting processes or competing with biology that that is beneficial that we want to have thrive, but now we're creating an environment where they can no longer, you know, they're competing for the same resources. You know what I mean? I totally. Yeah, I do. I do. I think it, it yeah, I think it comes down to your native bacteria, your, your native microbial population that's adapted to that location with all factors. Mm -hmm. And so for us, when we take a look at, at a thing and we say this particular bacteria that we've identified affects calcium or magnesium uptake. And so we say, okay, that's a positive thing for us to enter into our, our system because it has a result we desire, but because we don't understand the relationship between that and other forms of bacteria and how it will interact with our native bacteria that are developed to actually work in the environment you're in, it, it becomes kind of like, like Frankenstein in a sense where we, we don't really know. Yeah. Yeah. And so for yeah, me, really no. And so for me, when I, whenever we, you know, we build the the bags or the or the beds or whatever we're using, we're always trying to begin the process with the 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 leaf litter from the hill. And so I basically gather up the local leaf litter that's all fallen underneath, and then I brew that, and that gives me a like I would call it like a base inoculant. I'm not scoping it either, so it's it's not even an accurate scientifically accurate um essay it's just i'm collecting what's there and i'm putting it into my media that we've introduced because it's uninoculated and i i allow that to be really my base driver and anything that i want to add from then i can add endophytically through foliar application so that i'm able to at least have some some ideas of these things have this impact and because I'm adding it through the leaf, uh, it's going to have to go through the plant, exit, come out through the root, come back up inside. It'll, it'll create that, that cycle. I should have less overall impact and risk. But without having like a soil scientist on site to where you're scoping everything you're doing and you're really able to take a look at a, 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 a cross section of soil and then say, when we add these bacteria, we add these fungi, what happens to the population and what is the bigger picture. And I think that that's what's like so interesting about the white paper was it it said, hey, in a vacuum, these things control these things. And what we get is we get higher measurable levels of these particular things. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that the human who consumes it is going to be impressed with what was increased? And so when we, when we look at what yeah, because at the end of the day, when we're when we're artificially driving, we're creating larger populations that would normally be there. There's not something that's creating it. We're we're inoculating to, to right. increase a pop. Mm -hmm. With that increase, does that mean that what it's gathered is going to relate to consumability? So, like when we measure these things for me it's always like it's fascinating because when when you play with science all the time right like i get to work with science teams science says this right here is the is the the one but when you consume it you're like i wouldn't buy it twice so yes it's incredible in every aspect you're defining but in the one key aspect that the customer cares about did it give it what it wants and so that's sure. like the beauty of this riddle because really we're trying to say hey we can we can learn from all this this 
this new science of how to look at a, a, a soil and look at some of the most complex chemical reactions in the world occurring in a, in a teaspoon and then really figure out what's the value to the individual. Because I mean, at the end of the day, like if I was growing cannabis for visual, or I was growing it for biomass, a lot of these things, you know, would be the way you would steer. But because we're creating it for consumption, you know, what really defines metabolite production that reflects in the consumer's um, enjoyment? Yes. Yeah. That's like to me, that's the riddle that's really the confusing one. Like, why are some places mm -hmm. better? I just I just got the indexes back. Well, I got the soil back from um, Pakistan. So it just mm -hmm. it just got to me here in the US. And so the idea is to be able to take a look at that soil and see if we can have it essayed both been a whatever is left biologically, it's been kept cool and then minerally. And then maybe that'll give us some insight as to what are we really, you know, looking at from the base genes that we use now. And so it's not to like replicate it, but it's to understand it because I'm just like, why are those sure. profiles so much more profound in person than when we play with them? What are we not and, doing? And we probably wouldn't be able to replicate it because we're not in Pakistan. No, you no know, exactly. We don't, we don't have, have the, the entire system. system. Mm -hmm. yes, there's, yes. There's so many different aspects that stack on top of each other. There's so many different um, elements at play when it comes to like plant cultivation and cannabis cultivation, you know, between our profiles of amino acids and enzymes and biology, mineral mm -hmm. composition, clay and sand and silt and, uh, you know, our, our specific uh, aeration, like, like our worms, you know, like species of worms and uh, populations of worms and biology inside of the soil, like all these things stack up on top of each other, um, as well as just a profile of nutrients itself, which can vary place to place and create different expressions. Um, in the, in the, um, in the paper, they talk about, uh, potassium deficiency is actually creating like a stress that increases mm -hmm. yeah, potassium the, and water levels. Mm -hmm, that's right. Yeah. And so like stress, you know, like stress levels will change the way that the, the cannabis expresses itself and tastes in the end. And at times can be more flavorful or have more aroma when they're stressed at certain times in their life, which yeah, yeah, no, if you're it, growing it, up, yeah. And if you're growing outdoors, like you can't really control mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Well, Sorry, it's no, no, it's I'm all excited because it's, it's to me, it's the issue with crop steering. So, uh -huh. right. So like when we, and and it's not, I'm not anti-crop steering. It's extremely effective in what it does. It allows you to have control, but you're also managing stress and you're trying to minimize a, a lot of the stresses by making sure that we're at optimal water, optimal uptake. And what I've noticed is that because everybody's running the same basic crop steering methodology, it's cannabis better. kind of tastes kind of similar and it's, it's not identical. just the genes. It's the same issue I have with when you're volatizing a concentrate at a set temperature, it's the same as a vaporizer. You're not, you're not, you're only getting a single swath of profile because it's what is in that range. And it kind of makes it very similar. And mm -hmm. so that's what we, I had a discussion with someone that, that um, a really successful indoor grower and, he, he produces beautiful product, but he's kind of the old way of, you know, he measures his runoff. So I call it like steering by reverse. So he's a chemical grower, indoor chemical operation. Mm -hmm. But because he steers from reverse and he's not really monitoring the water content in the same way, he's allowing there to be more stress fluctuations within the plant's life cycle. And by not using some of the tools that are used to optimize, he gets a little less quantity of flour, but he gets a far higher level of customer enjoyment in flour, which is what his brand is known for. Mm -hmm. And so we were having this discussion about, you know, what's the impacts when you, when you use tools, they give you a result. But the way that most people measure anything in agriculture is by yield per square meter ton per you know ton per acre right so like yeah. you know i think that's why that's why i follow your work because you do some really interesting experiments to me where you introduce things that you believe are going to create an impact and then because you're messing with your genes and you're um competent with what you're looking at you're able to really make some interesting conclusions based off of when i added this to this i got that
Mm-hmm. And then because you're in the, you're having people consume it, you're consuming it, it's being actually used. You're able to say, hey, that was a positive addition to my repertoire. And I think that that's the the thing with the the white papers is that whenever I look at them, they're riveting because they get you get to really see a detail, but held in a vacuum. And right. it's kind of like how do we how do we take some of this information and really start to work with it? You know, how do you get the community mm-hmm. to get access to the 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 microbes in a way that would let a bunch of people play their own little experiments in a single pot outside and just do you know testing. It makes it tough, you know, it's just, you got to educate yourself, you know, like there's, there's Mm -hmm. concepts that people can, can learn and and study. And then a lot of the times, you know, first of all, I appreciate the kind words that you said, but a lot, a lot of the times I really have no idea what (laughs) I'm going down, you're going down your rabbit hole. Like you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know that you're just chasing. I'm just, you know, like I, I look up concepts and I follow principles and I integrate them based off of my understanding of those principles um, and what research has been laid before me. And then I either mimic or adopt it or, you know, change it just a little bit to try to integrate it um, and then hope that it works out. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, because without, you know, expensive equipment, I am unable to determine whether or not, um, you know, I was able to uh, uh, keep an organic acid in its original form or whether it fermented, you know, with biological processes and turned it into something else. Um, you know, like phytohormones and stuff, like going after phytohormones, um, something that I'm really big into. But when you integrate it into biology, into bacteria, um, bacteria changes the composition of organic acids, um, but it can also stabilize organic acids. Um, bacteria can also destroy organic acids and organic acids have um, unique physiological effects on plants. And so we chase after these specific inputs that have these profiles of organic acids or phytohormones you know, which are just organic acids, and we integrate them into systems with complex biology, we really don't know if they're changed, if they're stabilized, or if they're destroyed. Um, and so you kind of got to just hope for the best all the time. And the best way that we can deal with that is, or just to kind of like move forward is to see a, like a, a beneficial response in the plant, right? Like I added this thing, and I saw a response in the plant. Um, I made this, sol- you know, phosphor solubilizing um, concoction, and I notice an immediate swell in bud development, or um, tailoring something specific for a specific growth phase to encourage or discourage certain behaviors in the plants, like stretching or you know, uh, growth rates, node stacking, things like that. Right, like playing with different stuff. And really, the best way that we can go forward is: Did it work? Did did we accomplish what we were hoping for? And a lot of the time, it's really hard to tell. It could just be very specific to the genetic. You know, some genetics may respond to things different than others. And there's just so many variables that we work with in soil between, you know, everything that I had mentioned earlier, all the different mineral compositions and soil compositions, and everything like that. Um, so it's just. It's just kind of like have an idea, chase it, go for it, integrate it, and see what happens, right? And that's what I try to just encourage people to do. Um, but it's a fun game to play. But a lot of the time, you know, who knows what we're actually doing? Like it's it's so complex. You know, we we barely know what's going on in the soil beneath our feet, which is one of the things that fascinates me so much about it. Is that it's it's this infinite world that's changing and adapting and evolving constantly, and we're just kind of like watching it and like in wonder you know just hoping that we can understand it and utilize it to the best Mm. truth no i got lucky that i i got to do a couple of tours with uh the regenerative Mm -hmm. science group and it was it was fascinating because all of them were really brilliant in their craft and they've been very successful in their respective areas and it was just so neat to see how big that area is when you go from Elaine Ingham, the world of aerobic into like Alan Atkinson, the world of anaerobic uh-huh. and, and how, and how they, they both work. Somehow the miracle is they both work. Yeah. They, and, yeah. Right. They both work. And how do you, how do you determine what that word means and where's the line that separates it? And it was just really interesting to see how many different ways there really were to achieve a, a, a result. And as I started to, you know, be able to be more and more aware of all these different ways people have figured out how to drive natural agriculture, as I started to do more travel globally to work on projects, that was the methodologies that we used. And each 
situation was just so unique to the situation and it was it was it was infinite and that, that's what makes you know what we do so interesting because really i don't know if if you have the ability right now scientifically to really do a complete essay if there's a billion microorganisms in a teaspoon yeah right yeah right <laughs> you know and, and so it, it, yeah and so to me you know i think that's what's so interesting is that the, the science is helping us understand what particular bacteria did what. We noticed that this had this impact, kind of like um, uh, what was the what was the? It has a funny name, uh, mammoth P. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mammoth P, I think yeah. mammoth P has like a 15, 16 percent increase compared to control on your FOS uptake. Mm -hmm. But it was because he identified specific bacteria. Species. Yes, that would. Uh -huh. um, you know, serve a function and then he put it into play and it's been, and I've never used it personally, but it's, it's um, been a very successful product in the world. And to me, I think that's like one of the, f a side of the stuff that T lab, you know, Luke was releasing, which was also phosphorus solubizing uh, bacteria. Um, you just, you know, it's the beginning of it where people will be able to say, Hey, if I want to operate in this fashion and use it and, you know, give it a shot and see, do I get the, do I get the impact and the improvement? But like for me being outside, it's a little, it, to me, it's a little different because outside the complexity is so wicked that at the end of the day, I'm, I'm really hoping that all the microbial populations that are around the farm are inhabiting my plants. Right. And, you know, I, I want that symbiosis. And yeah, because I know that we've noticed in, uh, what we would call like the, the scent and flavor of the triangle where there's, there's subtleties you can pick up from, from farms that are near madrones or they're near fir or they're near oak. And you really start to mm -hmm. see it in the cannabis. And it, yeah. was, it was just patterns we noticed. And then when I went and did a mapping operation recently, I started mapping the locations where we were looking at the plants and what was the foliage and what was the crops that were near them so that I could start to look for patterns of, are the plants creating metabolite profiles that match so they benefit and then also shield from, from problems in that situation. And you started to see patterns occur. And that's why I gathered soil so samples. Cool. And yeah, cause I'm trying to it's understand. so cool. I love it. I'm just trying to understand like, because that, like this isn't my forte, it's just, it's so riveting to me because I know so, this, this is where to me, I'm like absolutely, um, little kid in, in the world of soil science, because every time I are. dig into it, I, it's a, it's a tube that goes forever. And I'm just trying to understand better how these things relate to what I work with, with just plant development. And mm -hmm. so for me, if I can understand better the relationship between the bottom end and the top end, then I have an idea of really how to position this plant into the world that we're using, because if you're not going to use these methodologies, then you're not going to get the same result. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and that was something that was kind of mentioned or they kind of touched on some of the things that you were talking about where different plant species themselves have different biology, you know, living in the rhizosphere of the, mm -hmm. you know, of the plant. So when you have them surrounding your garden, that specific profile of biology and the specific compounds that they secrete and how they physiologically affect our cannabis plant will change its expression to make it unique to that area like you were discussing. And it kind of brings up the point of like integrating companion plants um, or like a living mulch, right? Like the different plants that we have growing, um, you know, within our garden, within our rhizosphere will affect the way that, you know, the biology changes the plant. It'll, it'll change the composition of, of the biology of the profile of biology in the soil and change the, the expression of the plant itself. Oh, completely. I think that when you look at, if you're, if you're looking at plants in their native areas and you can better understand like where we took the plant from, mm -hmm. then you realize like anything equatorial has, has humus. There's, there's decaying plant material. So you have a humus base to mine from, but anything that's high mountain desert does not. It's basically, you know, glacial silt mm -hmm. and whatever they're applying. And so to me, it's, it's, the bacteria that have formed to be able to most effectively pull the max out. So if you took the bacteria that mine the max amount of things that would be found in humus and then apply it to another plant, would you over 
mine? Would you overfeed the plant? Would you create too much of an uptake? And subsequently, if you took them vice versa, would you starve the plant because it was so much mineral that it would it wouldn't bring as much in? Like the how do you ma manipulate the relationship from the plants based off of the relationships they had to have formed in their natural environments? Right. A hundred percent, you know, because the difference between like medicine and poison is dose, right? And the same yes, thing is with yes, plants, yes. You know, like like oxen is a growth hormone, but if you pump a plant with oxen, you're just going to kill it. You know, or, so there mm -hmm. are herbicides based off of oxen. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, it's a fine line to walk. And oftentimes we're just kind of hoping for the best, um, creating different application rates and experimenting with different things. But, you know, you add too much, um, too many enzymes to your soil, you're going to see your plants burn. You can melt the worms and melt the roots in your soil, adding too many enzymes. But they're such a crucial part of nutrient cycling, as well as creating a foundation for biology to thrive and to multiply in. Um, they're crucial. But add too much, and you ruin your harvest. You ruin your plants. I've I've done it before. You know, we're kind of just playing with playing with fire sometimes. How do you how do you record and then you know improve? Are you just are you are you noting that when you when you did your application, you put X amount in and you then notice that, hey, I destroyed my rhizosphere. Next time I'll go less. Is there so, is there a rule of thumb with decreasing from to me? Like you almost always have to go into. Small. Yeah. Like we always once we know once we know where the far end of push is, we can go back that luxury consumption zone and mm -hmm. find out where really no more inputs make a difference. And like, that's the sweet spot. Well, it's also like the kind of enzyme that it is. So what I did is I added too much of a proteolytic enzyme, a protease that breaks down proteins into amino acids. And when I did that, it broke down <laughs> the cells of my roots and killed my plants. Um, and this was a, a fermentation of, of pineapple. I did this probably like 10 years ago now. Um, but I did fermentation of pineapple, which has, uh, you know, a very strong protease. So you can add, you know, pineapple to, you know, some kind of protein source and it'll actually break it down into amino acids, but in too strong of concentrations, giving it to your soil, you can kill all your worms, you can kill all your plants. Um, so to answer your question though, really just start small. <laughs> and if you're using something that you're not familiar with or haven't used before, start small um, and familiarize yourself with like the composition of whatever input that you're using. Uh, there's a website called Dr. Duke's Phytochemical Database where you can punch in whatever plant that you're using um, and it'll give you the uh, phytochemical breakdown with all the organic acids and all of the uh, nutrient composition within that plant. And I encourage people to always do that when you're making something new. So like, for example, you know, there's juniper trees around me here. Um, and if I wanted to like use the berries from the juniper trees, I think it would be prudent of me, and I have before look up the profile of the the compounds inside of the juniper tree or the, the, the juniper berries and see if it's something that's going to be beneficial or something that could be potentially harmful. And you know, we're given this long list of chemicals that most of the time, you know, we aren't familiar with. But thanks to like AI and stuff, you can plug those lists of chemicals in and you know, talk to, you know, AI about like the physiological effects that it can have on, on plants or interactions with soil microbes and stuff like that. A lot of the time, the answer is, we don't know, because there's so many different variables and factors and interactions that we can't predict, or understand or have been experimented with, because the world of soil is just so vast. But um, there's some really cool techniques that we can do now to, to work with these concepts and kind of push forward and integrate new things that haven't been done before. Um, a lot of the time, you know, we see people do stuff online and we're like, wow, that's really cool. I want to do exactly what they're doing. Um, and it's great. And I love it. And I love that that people have improved their gardens with these different techniques and stuff. But I encourage people to like, like make your own stuff, like like come up with something like on your own, you know, like that, that makes your garden very unique with your approach so that your flower doesn't smoke or taste like anyone else's. Um, and earlier you were talking about crop steering and, and how it kind of creates like a really consistent uh, product that can potentially taste uh, the same. Um, and I think that sometimes that's what's like kind of like the spice is the variation, right? Like we mm -hmm. as humans, things are when things are too consistent, they kind of lose their excitement. Like if you ate, you know, a McDonald's cheeseburger every single day, 
you know, it it's not going to be as enjoyable as let's say you had it like once every year or something, or you ate like a high end steak the same every day and it was perfectly con consistent. It would no longer be as enjoyable. So like these small variations in like cannabis expression through different cultivation techniques, I think are what really brings out like the enjoyability of of consuming cannabis, tasting the different expression, and even growing the same genetic just differently um, in different soil compositions. You can see how they express themselves differently. Uh, I was growing a Gelato 41 cut here this year, and I had an older soil that had been sitting on this property for like 10 years, and then I had my brand new soil that I had built uh, a couple, well, I guess it's not brand new, a couple years ago. Um, and the expression in the Gelato 41 plant was completely different. Like the, the structure was kind of the same, but like the color was different, the aroma was different, um, the the uh, complexities, the profile were different, and and how it like retained its aroma changed, and as it cured, like they turned, they took different paths, just because the soil composition was different, but the light spectrum was the same. I did everything the same for both of the soils, you know, in terms of watering and adding teas mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Um, yeah, <laughs> just like ranting at this point, but there's no, so no, many different good, things. I want to say yeah. though, before we go any further, um, uh -huh. have uh, if if Pete's on and have him list that website that you just said. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Put that on. Put that list it on the screen. So this it. way, yeah, yeah, because that's priceless. This way that people can grab it when they when they go dig because. It, it's that's what you need to do is you really need to be able to ask, hey, before I start, because I went on, I went on a run. I started researching this stuff years ago when I when I I had heard about people in the Philippines that had cultured an uh, in, in indigenous microorganism species that they utilized in their ag, but they passed it on like sourdough. And so they would pass this culture on and they, you know, that was like a century old, but they used it for their, for their farming. And so I was riveted and I said, well, I said, I want to start mining. And so I created my own IMO stuff and I went on my own dive into let me go and grab microbes. Mm -hmm. And as you go through the process and you start doing your brews, you start realizing, whoa, I, I went too far with something and just smoked that crop. Right. And, and it was trial and error, but you know, so you're trying to find, but you're right with the AI, it allow you to be able to uh, sift through the, the formulations easily and say, hey, Faster. what are some of the known impacts? And then that, that website lets us actually grab what's in these elements. Mm -hmm. Because for us that, that are trying to understand it, if you don't have a huge base of screwing up, you're gonna do a lot of screwing up, which oh, is yeah. all right. It's just it's that there's, it. there needs to be some path to to a like fruition and then you you start to find your path but but a general path to get there so that you know you're able to to say okay we're at least succeeding and now we want to refine because right. if you kill too many things you kind of you know like you get to i don't know i killed a, i killed a lot of stuff yeah yeah you're gonna yeah. be a nut yeah i've killed a lot of plants too. <laughs> yeah so in in the things that i've killed it helped me greatly but in this one, it's it's how do we figure out how to how to use the things that are indigenous to our farms and utilize these things if 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 they have a beneficial impact in a way that we can quantify. Right. Because sometimes Cause you might yeah. yeah, you might introduce something that's toxic. Oh, know? totally. No, no, that's what I and, and that's what I that's that's where you know you brought in that you had, had you had driven too much of that pineapple. Uh, enzyme in and because it's so powerful you ended up liquefying your roots yeah that was a good that was tragic <laughs> but yeah so, so it's always good to like you know check what you're using and like research stuff um but like one thing that i really like to use is um beet juice have you ever tried mm -hmm. using i noticed juice? that yeah so beet juice has a you know very it has okay uh a polysaccharide called inulin in it um and back when I was making a lot of kombucha, I was using different, um, you know, flavors, different sugar sources to to make different flavors of kombucha, right? And I noticed that when I made red beet kombucha, it carbonated significantly faster and more than every, any other one that I used. And I was like, you know, like, why is this? And it's the prebiotic, which is, you know, po uh, polysaccharides are prebiotics. And I started like, you know, getting fascinated with introducing prebiotics into the soil. Um, and aloe vera has, um, I, forget, I don't know how to pronounce the word, I just read it, I think it's asimenin, um, which is another polysaccharide. And when I kind of dive deep into like asimenin, like it has all these really interesting um, 
uh, like effects on soil and soil biology. And, you know, Coot back in the day was the one who was like, use aloe vera. Um, and it works, you know, using aloe vera. And, and so I, I saw like the, with the red beet and the kombucha, and I was like, you know, what happens when we put this in our soil? Um, and I've been adding it to the soil and seeing a great benefit from it. Um, but also um, through looking stuff up on the database, um, it also contains nitric oxide, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, also has, you know, plant physiological stimulating effects um, when introduced to the soil. So we're adding, when we use different like plants, we're adding these different things that can change its, its expression completely. Um, and I just, I am so fascinated by like exploring the different compounds and organic acids and you know polysaccharides polyphenols and how they affect things and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't and you know that's okay and but it's also interesting to keep in mind how like uh you know plants communicate plants and bacteria that communicate to each other through like terpenes right mm -hmm. um and volatized compounds um just through the air will communicate to other plants and so like even using them in like foliar application you can signal different responses in the plant because those plants have like a terpene profile or a volatile compound profile that will signal the plant to do specific things. Um, like one, for example, is jasmonic acid, which was originally, mm -hmm. um, you know, discovered from, you know, jasmine, uh, which is why they call it jasmonic acid. And it's a, a, a stress response uh, compound. It, it triggers like a physiological stress response that will cause like growth spurts, right? So it's interesting that, you know, we were talking about like different biology being affected in the rhizosphere by like plants like growing around, but also those plants will use like their terpene um, signaling to the plants surrounding them just in the air as like those compounds volatize and just like drift onto like, you know, the leaves or the, the plants, whatever, and that will also change like the expression of the plant. So like your, your native plant environment surrounding your garden will also communicate to your cannabis plants to express themselves differently. Um, and you see people like, um, I, forget, I think it's Huckleberry Farm, um, where they grow like all those th those awesome flowers and stuff, like that's in their in their root zone, like that's gonna change the expression of the plant. It's so cool and it looks so beautiful, right? Oh yeah, yeah, uh, no, they did a great job. The thing, the jasmonic acid, there's a bunch of companies that took jasmonic acid and then you know, use it as a flavor enhancer. And it, it was like, they would call it like, you know, terp booster. And you would get a higher measurable, specifically in terpenes, because that's what the science, that's what your COAs measure. It doesn't measure anything other volatile, but you would see higher increases in it. But the, the funny thing was jasmonic acid to me triggered a very specific response. It didn't, it didn't make the profile of each plant so much broader. It made a very specific range within each plant very similar really? and it, it was yeah so I, jasmonic acid used to be hella popular but he was using it to get a you know louder signature but you could always tell the people that used it because it was loud in a very narrow band all the other odors were present yeah so to me like jasmonic acid is is a a, a, a signaler but it only signals certain things. And so like, huh. what are the other things that we can utilize in that same vein? Right. Because that's right. what I didn't like about it was that I had, I, I knew people that had companies that made the products and I just, re I just read the label and said, wait a minute, this is just jasmonic acid. Was it isolated it, jasmonic acid? Was it just jasmonic acid? Yeah. Jasmonic acid within it, within, and they might've put a couple other things in there so that you have, um, the idea of complexity. Entourage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and cannabis, cannabis marketing's cannabis marketing. But at the end of the day, the product that was doing the driving, the, the, was the substance was jasmonic acid in it, but it produced a very significant impact in a very specific way. And so I didn't see like, you know, it didn't make OG more OG. It made OG mm -hmm. have a certain profile. It made Blue Dream have oh. a certain profile. It changed it, but towards a specific direction. Mm -hmm. And it always made me wonder, you know, are there other substances that if we understood how to use them, we would be able to, you know, trigger and drive the plant in its natural desire, meaning that if we're trying to take a plant that has a fruit profile, you know, ester based, mm -hmm. how do we find the substances that make that particular response better? Right. 
So I you know a, a lot of those 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 compounds, um, you know, are that are biosynthesized, like in the the trichome head, they require very specific enzymes to be present, which are you know built off of you know different compounds below it. And if they're not present, those enzymes can't be you know made. They can't be made by the plant, and then you're lacking that expression. So I'm, I've been curious as to if we can identify the very specific enzymes that are being used to create these very specific, um, you know, volatile compounds and introduce them to the soil or the leaf surface, if it would promote that very specific terpene or very specific totally, aroma. Totally. And then, you know, at that point, like, can we just make anything smell like anything? <laughs> or can we can we have very specific tailored concoctions that make an OG more OG or a fruit more fruit? Or can we add a gas element to a fruit or to an earthy, you know, like, like what, what is the the plant actually capable of doing? What are its genetic limitations, and can we change that through different things that we're feeding it or applying to it? And uh, you know, the answer is like I I, I don't know, but um, no, but it's fascinating because it's about accentuating the the expression of the product that comes from your location. So there's there's a farmer locally, um, Wendy, and she and I are, are friends. We we work with the Gangier. But Wendy and I have like a joke because her farm wasn't a gas farm. It was a fruit farm. And my farm is not a fruit farm. It's a gas farm. Meaning that everything that I put up there, if it's fruit, it gets kind of muted. But if it's fuel, if it's, if it's, which is really like stress response, it shines. Interesting. But for her, it's the opposite. She doesn't have enough. She has a more buffered environment. Her, her farm is more gentle. And because of it, it allows there to be a different formation of metabolites that really accentuate fruits and, you know, s like slight florals far more than, you know, gas and earth. And that's what just, that it's, means. it's going to be, it's going to be biology and mm -hmm. the stress response from the location. So like, if we right. were able to say, Hey, the things that shine on my Hill naturally, if I could accentuate that biologically, mm -hmm. Ooh, you'd have something incredible. Because now what you have really is is process that is working in conjunction in a, like I would say, like an organic way where it, it, it wants to head that direction. So instead of taking a plant and making it change its profile because we're driving it, to me, it would be better to find the natural profile and accentuate right. it because mm -hmm. it would be less effort for the plant. The plant wouldn't have to, I mean, we'd only know by consumption. Mm -hmm. Just kind of like but, encourage its maximum genetic potential. Yes, yes. You're trying yeah. to encourage it in that way and just accept that not all plants should be grown at all locations. Right. That's fair. You know, find what works in your area and promote mm -hmm. it. And that mm -hmm. and that's that would define your farm. And really, you know, you would have like a true SOP because you right. would have a biological plan, you'd and you'd understand the 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 macro environment and how it was impacting the organism. Mm-hmm. Um, so something that was talked about in the, the document also was that there are uh, specific species that are present in the soil in the rhizosphere uh, during different growth phases of the plant. And this mm -hmm. kind of ties into like the rhizophagy cycle, um, which is so fascinating. Um, and just kind of like a quick overview of the rhizophagy cycle for, for you know, our viewers. Uh, the rhizophagy cycle is where um, the plant signals to the root zone through different um, amino acids, enzymes, and carbohydrates to encourage specific species of bacteria to solubilize specific nutrient sources um, to make them available for plant uptake. And so as the plant um, phases change and the development of the plant changes, it changes the profile of these compounds, these root exudates, to um, encourage specific biology to break down specific nutrients to make them available for the plant. And so throughout the growth processes, we're going to see that profile change. Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, and, you, you um, know, it, it, was, it was about the specificity of the bacteria in relationship to the growth stage. Right. Um, so it's interesting, like, uh, at times it makes me wonder, like, do we want to introduce specific bacteria constantly? Or should we just let the roots, you know, communicate by themselves? Like the more we add bacteria, like perpetually, a very specific profile of bacteria, like in here they're talking like Bacillus subtilis and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, 
so on, these different common bacillus species that you see on like bottled inoculants and stuff, are we interrupting the natural cycle of, of the, the rhizophagy cycle that is super dependent um, on these very specific profiles of, of compounds in the, the root zone? Like, are we interrupting the functionality by adding bacteria constantly and adding ferments constantly? And perhaps it's better to just set the stage for diversity and like, let it go. Let the plant communicate with the bacteria itself. I had that. I know I, I had the same idea because once I really understood that exudates create the mechanism that it drives the population to increase because mm -hmm. without, without a food source, you're not going to get more multiplication. Mm -hmm. And so the plant is, is multiplying and then it starves them off quickly and then they die and then their death releases what's uptakeable. Mm -hmm. Right. So the bacteria itself has to has to perish in order for this process to really occur. And so I said, well, if the plant is multiplying, and killing bacteria, then maybe what really is needed is just a broad consortium. And at the end of the day, once we get a colony that's pretty broad, we really don't need to continuously add because the plant should be able to control what's there through its own exudate uh, uptake. I mean, how it's pushing it out and what it's put, what it's asking for it to come back mm -hmm. because it's saying, Hey, I need more of this. I need more zinc. I need more manganese. And so right. it has that relationship with those bacteria that do the uptake. And by segregating what compounds come out of the root, it controls what occurs. So maybe mm -hmm. there's just a level of colonization that we need and but it's just how do you know that like how do you you know understand enough's enough or not enough is is not enough but i i think that there's like what we do is we do things that make us feel good sometimes someone says to me like it, does, it, it, are you doing anything right now that's valuable i said no it just makes me feel good and uh, it, yeah. it's not hurting anything but right. I'm, yes i'm wasting my time but it uh -huh. makes me feel good and uh -huh. that's part of being a weed grower is that we yeah. get to do things that make us feel good that are fun yeah totally yes Mm. That's so funny. Yeah, when I was, I remember, it kind of reminds me when I was a kid, like, um, one of my favorite games was like to take a bunch of different plants and like throw them in a big bucket of water. Like we have, or it was like a, you know, those old like disc chairs mm -hmm. like from back in the day, like we would turn it sideways and fill it with water and throw like a whole bunch of different plants in there and just let it all like putrefy. And we were talking, like it was our potion game. And then we would like, yeah, just yeah, dump yeah, it on yeah, the yeah. garden, you know, and I was doing that as a kid. And like, it, it was like my favorite thing to do when I was younger. And now that's what I do as an adult, <laughs> you know? Oh yeah, no, it's fascinating. You're rotting so things fun. down. Yeah. Yeah, and it's no, like, putrefaction it's like, is, it, it's, once you start to get into like, you know, breaking things down biologically, you know, you, you're fascinated with breaking shit down. It's so cool, you know? Yeah, it's, no, it's good, it's, it's good. And it's, good. Like, and it's like, who knows, like if, if we're doing the best thing for the plant, you know, who, who knows, but I'm having fun doing it. I like seeing what's happening. I like mm -hmm. the, the 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 expression that comes from the plant afterwards and maybe things could be better whatever i'm having fun and i'm doing what makes sense to me right and that's what i encourage people to do just like just have I mean, fun. there's no map to follow though you know you're right. you're you're, you're leading your own way and so the thing is you know mm -hmm. you're blazing a trail based off of intuition and i think that you know we've we've come to a point with individuals where you know science says this and i'm like yeah but in a vacuum if you play with right. that stuff in real time, you're going to find it's not so cut and dry. And that's intuition. That's where you you had an idea. You played with it enough to say, look, you know, I've, I've touched it 200 times. I'm telling you that shit's hot. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I don't need a thermometer to measure it. I just know that mm -hmm. I burned my fingers 200 times in a row. And it just helps you see patterns. And I think that that's, you know, the 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 relationship that humans had with plants is that we saw patterns. We understood to look for these sequences that help us understand a, a change. So with plants, you don't see rapid change unless it's catastrophic usually, right. but you, you get to see the, the signals of change and you start to say, Hey, when I see these things happening, this is the result that's occurred in the past. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've left that world and we were obsessed with more like total control. And, and really agriculture wasn't total control. It was, flexible control you you worked with the rhythm of what was present and that basic skill is present in all cultivators anybody who's a cultivator has that rhythm even if they run the most sophisticated sop based program there is 
Mm-hmm. They understand why that SOP program is there because they, they probably initiated it. Right. But the, the ability to see and feel and work with it. And it, I mean, that's just the fascinating part. And like, I love, I love working with science teams on projects because they take you into areas that you just couldn't have gone because they, they spent their life in that lane and you spent yours mm-hmm. in another one. So you right. get to see things from some really fascinating perspectives, but it also lets you know just how little we really understand about what we're really doing. And, yeah. and I think that's what makes, you know, the, like the future cannabis <laughs> project stuff. So cool. Yeah. Because yeah, you got a like lot of people kind of that are, yeah, we're, 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 we're geeking out on stuff that we're fascinated with and we're not afraid to say we only know so much about it because mm-hmm. there's no, there's no one entity that knows it all. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's, that's what's cool. Yeah. But I think, I mean, but I think that you're, you got your own lane with what you do. That's why, like I said, I don't follow, like I, I keep track of the industry all around me, but I, I'll actually read and check out what you're doing I think so. because yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a genuine compliment. And it's just that what's important is for people to understand that what you're doing is you're, you're laying out your hypothesis and then you're going through the steps to explain how you got the hypothesis and then you lay out the success or the failure of that execution Mm -hmm. and so what it does is it it just it it, it let me learn about beets being a really good polysaccharide that has an as an incredible impact on plants because i just noticed that you were always using it and so i said hey i'm going to research why you're always using beet but it's, it's it's stuff like that that's critical, you know. It 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 allows it allows all of us that aren't diving into those lanes to be able to explore it. I I try to share information with people that are in that's in my lane, and it allows people to see things that I get to see, which most people don't get to see, and it it allows us to be able to share information in 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 a way where you get really you know a killer community. Yeah. Which is the microbial I mean, herd. We're like, art. we're creating yeah. our microbial herd. Yeah. We're, we're, yeah. we're creating <laughs> so cool. the rhizosphere. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that, you know, like while we're cultivating our cannabis, we're also like influencing the ecosystem around us. You know, we're using regenerative agriculture techniques mm-hmm. to help regenerate, you know, not just the soil that we're growing in, but the soil around us. And it just, it feels good. You know, it's an art, it's a science. It's also healing to the earth and healing to people. And so I find it very rewarding. No, I like it too. I get to, I got, I got a really, um, I had a great opportunity where my neighbors have a a horse ranch and they, they used to be in the soil making business. And with the change in the cannabis industry, there's just no need for it anymore. And so now they had their, their straw and their, the, the horse waste. And they were like, you know, what do we don't, we have to go have to dump it. We have nowhere to put it. And I said, Hey, wait a minute. I have property. That's not my cannabis farm. I wish I could get it up there. But I said, I have property. I said, why don't you just start dumping it on my yard and then I'll flatten it out and I'll, I'll cover crop it and I'll start doing like a deposition method of regenerative ag. I'm taking your waste and applying it on top of our clay soil. And so I put, I don't know, 20 tons so far. <laughs> I mean, I've been doing this for a minute, man. So I'm like, I'm creating this yeah. massive deposition bed that just requires me to throw some hay on it. And then I go buy a cover crop mix from the local ag store and it allows me to start really mining and bringing up. And then once I can get this based in, then I'll be able to run um, some deep drilling radish in to start really bringing up some of the minerals and free up the soil. But it's all stuff I learned from being around the regenerative crew, you know, where, where they were like, Hey, regenerative agriculture, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just about trying to make sure you're, you're, you're not taking every single drop from anything. Right. And it was this idea, cause it's there's no, it. there's, yeah, you're trying to be functional. And I just said, Hey, I have this opportunity. And they said, just drop it on the ground, cover crop it. And so I, I just get a, I get a big trailer load in every two, three weeks. And then I just go shovel it by hand and spread it out and then hay bale it and cover crop it. And so over the next couple of years, yeah, I'll be able to transform that whole area into a really, really functional garden, but no till, I won't disturb that, that upper layer that I've built. I won't plow it into the ground. We'll mm-hmm. use the roots to break it up. And right. it's, it's stuff that I got, you know, information from, from you and from other individuals that I follow and got to work with. And all of a mm-hmm. sudden I'm beginning to build like a regenerative farm on my property. That's so cool. So, 
it's yeah, so fun. No, it's, it's rewarding great. and it's fun. It's great. Yeah. And it's yeah. free. And it's you free, know, yeah. and, it, and, it, and it frees up the landfill from their shit, you know, so this way the landfill isn't taken. The stuff that shouldn't go in the landfill should be broken down. And what you have available to you. Yep. Yep. And, mm -hmm. and, and put it to work. And then once we have it built, then we can come in and start doing some soil analysis and, and start to figure out, okay, how do we steer? But for right now, it's just deposition and root growth. And then once we get into the season and then trapping water, trying to trap it and, and slow it down so that it's, it's moving through that whole matrix more slowly so that we're actually getting deeper penetration. But all of those factors, all, all, it, it, it all goes along the same thing with like metabolite production, where if you, if you take a look at, at, at papers on, you know, nutrient load, if, if it's in a, you know, I would say like a biologically driven system, you typically don't have the spikes, but when you throw nutrients at a plant, they're saying that THC CBD production drops dramatically quickly. Mm -hmm. It comes back. But there's this response to that feeding that the plant says, I don't need to produce these compounds for whatever reason. And so mm -hmm. you see the spike in it and it's trying to figure out, you know, how do we make sure that those spikes aren't when we harvest? When you're, when you're driving uptake and you're getting a metabolite profile to be optimal, I mean, we can harvest in the dark, but if your levels are low because you're not driving them to the, the level they should be at, it doesn't matter when you harvest. The measurable, the measurable constituents are just low. You have to have all the pieces of the puzzle present and in balance. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and understand how to use them so you're able to make the decision of, you know, what to really do. Otherwise, right. it's your robotic. And with the cost, you know, the, the, with a lot of the new testing, the, the home labs and the, the devices, like we have one at the spot so we can do all our THC and just mm -hmm. to give us a rough idea where we're steering within direction, but the ability to have access to leaf analysis, soil analysis, cannabinoid analysis. And if you get it into a reasonable price, it would allow you to really understand a cultivar. It wouldn't, it wouldn't let you understand a, a population or a series of plants, but you'd be able to say, when I do this with this plant over a three year period, these are the windows that I've discovered that I have optimal results. Mm. That, yeah. which is tough because we don't get to grow plants for three years in cannabis. Right. You're, but it's good to and, take notes and, and, you know, record mm -hmm. that. Yeah. yeah. It, gives you, it lets you see patterns mm -hmm. and then the pattern allows you to be able to work with another cultivar and say, Hey, wait a second. When I lay the two data sets together, they're close enough to where I can kind of extrapolate that data and say, I should be able to see this similar pattern occur mm -hmm. because of it. So it, it's never bad to gather it. It's just that like, if we could be cultivators like normal cultivators, it would be lovely to say, take your cheese and grow it for the next 10 years and be able to really figure out, you know, how do we optimize our, our bottom end delivery? Like really what is, what is needed to get the response we need? Because you need enough food to create primary metabolites. So you get a plant. Mm -hmm. And then what is now buying for the secondary and why? Like, that's the riddle that we don't understand. Right. Uh, yeah. A lot of it, like I've noticed is amino acids and humates. Having enough mm -hmm. amino acids and humates while keeping like nitrates down is where mm -hmm. I've seen the most like terpene production. Um, just from like my playing around with stuff. Um, as well as like making sure that your biology levels are are appropriate. You know, you have enough protozoa, you have enough bacteria um, and fungi also, you know, introducing mycorrhizae and stuff like that. But um, having a balance of your nutrient profiles is crucial also. Um, uh, Michael Albrecht, um, oh, like Michael Albrecht, I don't know if you're familiar with Albrecht soil mi mineral balancing theory. Yes. Keeping, you know, having all of those, you know, because living soil is not just a community of, of life. It's also a perpetual chemical reaction mm -hmm. um, that's constantly happening based off of the interactions of the biology. Um, and so having that foundation in balance, for me, what I've noticed is if you have your soil in balance, you have your bacteria in balance, and you you integrate amino acids, enzymes, humates, carbohydrates, um, polysaccharides, that's how I've found to have like the best genetic expression is you have the foundation and then you you push it. You let you you let nature kind of run the system. 
Um, cause bacteria, you know, they need, they need amino acids, they need enzymes, they need a food source. Um, so you set the foundation with your minerals and your nutrients, and then you promote the bacteria and the, the microbes to then use that, that foundation to create what the plant needs instead of you kind of telling the plant what it needs and like trying to make the plant do stuff. You kind of just like set the foundation. You let like nature do it and give nature what it needs to thrive. And that's how I've personally found the best results when cultivating cannabis. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. I didn't have the ability to, to get my bottom end up to the, where I had enough cycling to get calcium moving quick enough. And I went into a folia program but it's, it's a humic based. And, and so you have aloe vera and humic as well. So you're driving your sugars and your uptake mechanisms in, and then you're delivering that with a, a micronutrient consortium so that you're able to really, you know, keep the growing tips moving. And for me, as at the product, the product changed dramatically at the farm because of it. And mm -hmm. in, in a really positive way, the stress response still gave me what I wanted, but I was able to get a plant that was able to really deal with that high stress level. And I, I knew that eventually, cause someone said, Hey, you shouldn't have to do it from the top. I said, I know, but like in a perfect world, I'm not living in one. I'm, I'm not able to right now to get my bottom end to, to that. I haven't adapted the plant and the bottom end together to where, where it effectively works. So I just know that when I'm running plants, if I run that foliar program, then what it does, it'll, it allows me to be able to, to get what I need where the plant can mine from that. But it's, it's a, a, a bandaid really, if, you know, compared to having the bottom end in a, in a, right. an effective cycle to where the plant and that are working in a cohesive manner. So I, I get around it and I, I'm grateful that I have a product that lets me get around it, but I know the goal is to really not have to get around it and be able to have the, <laughs> You know, <laughs> foundation there in place. Yeah. So Kevin, we were up on on an hour, a little bit over an hour. Um, maybe we could reach out to the audience, answer a few questions, and wrap it up for the evening. Sure, sounds great. Cool. So if anyone has any questions about this topic, um, or about the research paper, or some of the things that we've been discussing, um, you know, throw it in the comment section, and we'll try to have a little discussion. Maybe do like five five comments. Something like that. If anyone has any questions. Cool. You know, it'd be a good, you know, someone should throw in is they just did that, you know, absolute extracts just did that research project and they brought out a, a lot of information on uh, other metabolites that create certain scent compounds. And hopefully some of that publicity drives forward a, a more complicated COA. So that what we have is one that's not terpene based because we know that, and we've known this for a while. It's just that the more studies that come out, the the better that. Oh, look at a little wild one in the back. Um, it 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 allows there to 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 be the the education on what are we really looking at, and then you're able to start saying, okay, what are the other metabolites that we can measure that we can look at that lets us get a better fingerprint. So, what's this question? So the challenge becomes, how do we utilize these methodologies to produce end products that will pass compliance testing? So, I mean, when we're trying new things, you know, sometimes we don't know what the end result is and maybe we won't pass compliance testing. Um, you know, I always say don't foliar spray bacteria, you know, in flower if you know you're trying to pass, you know, a microbial compliance test. Um, or if you know that something might be high in like a heavy metals, maybe you shouldn't pump it super hard. Um, but a lot that, of the time, or the or the input, like what input are you actually? If, if the input's not coming from your property and you're sourcing mm -hmm. an input, that that's another one. Where if you're picking up compost or any kind of waste from some place, did that waste come from a yard that? had heavy glyphosate usage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was there, was there, you know, and, and some some locations have heavy arsenic. So like Lake mm -hmm. County has heavy arsenic issues. And so anything that's growing in the ground that you would utilize would have a heavy arsenic. And so for a lot of farmers there, they have to be um, above the soil. They have to create a real impermeable barrier. But at the end of the day, if you're if you're not spraying anything on the surface to creep to increase your total colony units, so that way you're not going to get caught with there. And the only other issue really would be heavy metals, which is what Luna said. And if you're taking a look at what you're working with, 
you shouldn't have any issues. It's just, we, we used to say spray compost tea on plants because it makes plants healthier. And a lot of ways it does. It creates this biological, you know, masterpiece of, of, of work. But the problem is it doesn't pass a test mm. in, in many states. So it's risky. Yeah, it can be. Um, how can you expect a plant to fully express without the correct indigenous biology? Well, I don't think that you can. No. It's, 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 we got to have our indigenous biology encourage the native species. It has to be lighting too. So, I mean, if we get right down to it, what the plants producing at zero is different than what the plants producing at 40. And so the communication, the, 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 the less of that angle of inclination, the greater the intensity, but also we, I don't think that we understand well enough the information that the plants providing via light. And I think mm -hmm. that you have microbes that are directly connected to that process. So you can never grow anything identically except in the place it was taken from. And so that right. takes all of Northern, North, all of North America right out of the equation, right? So everything we grow here is because we're the last on the development chain. So it comes, you know, 14,000 years, we have it recorded, but it took, you know, 14,000 years almost to get to us. Right. We, we're the loudest about it, but we have the least amount of experience and direction. So at the end of the day, the only way you can get a full expression from a plant it really is to put it in its native environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. A solid point. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have... Oh. I'm interested in plant biological age. And can we rejuvenate an old plant suffering from genetic drift into a younger, healthy version? of itself. So this is a, a conversation that I, that I've actually been having a lot recently. Um, I'd like to hear what you have to say and then I'll chime in. Okay. I noticed a pattern that plants that we remember, I'm like, I, I grew outdoors like in the late seventies and then, you know, late, late early eighties. And then we get into the indoor game, right? Where like for 25 years, you were only really running indoor. And when I started being able to have access to a small greenhouse, I would hold plants out in the greenhouse. And what I noticed was this incredible change in clonal rates. And I started to realize that I was keeping plants in a deprived environment, that it just, there was something different. And then I, I start to talk to, I, I get involved with, uh, I, I was, I was for Alan Atkinson is like, um, he helped me really understand this natural process of, of how anaerobically yeah. plants functioned. So I said, if we could take those plants and keep them in those situations, would the plant revert back to really its more raw form? And I got to utilize that theory against hoplite and viroid when it was first really identified. They didn't know what it was. So teams of scientists would provide me with plants and I would put them into these. I would take indoor plants that had experienced this issue and I would put them into um, a living soil matrix with sunlight. And what we got to watch was the plants, you know, I'm going to say revert. They would start to shed the cambial layer. You would see new, new plant material coming out of it as if it was mm -hmm. shedding its skin. And so does that mean it's a genetic drift? I don't think it was so much a genetic drift. I think it's more of lack of mineable materials needed for long-term health and not the adequate light spectrum to really actuate it. Interesting. Very interesting. So I've, I've like, I've had this discussion with, with my friend a lot recently, actually. Um, and I was kind of wondering, cause you know, like DNA, um, they're chains of, you know, it's chains of carbon, right? And like, um, you know, they're different forms of, you know, acid. Um, and if we don't have the full profile of nutrients available and enzymes available, does the genetic structure actually change if we're in like, if the plant has a deficiency and we clone off of it, has the genetic structure of that plant changed because it's missing components needed to fully build like the building blocks of the plant? Um, and also That's like, can we, can we bring that back? Um, I've seen in, in my days in the forums and the probiotic farmers Alliance, um, people would talk about cloning, uh, cloning forward is what we called it, where you took, you know, the apical stem of the plant, like the, you know, you don't top the plant, you grow it out, you keep the plant super healthy and thriving, and then you clone off of the only the top. And then you start it again and you do that over and over again to rejuvenate the plant, but you can't 
lose vigor, you can't have deficiencies. And then over time, you can see a genetic kind of build itself back up, which I've witnessed before. But I've also seen plants like legitimately genetically drift. Um, and not so much that the expression of the plant change, but the vigor of the plant change, the yield of the plant went down, the, the bud structure got poorer over time. Um, but I think that we can rejuvenate it over time through promoting vigor. Um, but I do wonder if we take clones off of deficient plants or sick plants, if the actual genetic structure of the plant has been damaged permanently. Um, and that's something I don't really know the answer to, but interesting it's an interesting kind of thing to to think about yeah it's 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 it is it is and you know we i just know the pattern of when it's not healthy and i biologically charge it and put it in the sun it usually gets healthy yeah right and 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 so we, we can say there's what, what's what's occurring but that what you said is fascinating because at the end of the day it's epigenetics the plant is changing to respond to the environment Mm -hmm. And does that plant material change enough to where it's a different plant? And if we would have, if we would have scrub it with a, like a Meristem scrub, would we then get it back to its original source or like, cause it's, it's hard, it's hard to really know because we've seen plants mm -hmm. that aren't quite the same over time. If you've right. held a plant long enough, there's changes that you just don't understand. And you're like, Oh, I got you. 100%. It's, clone after clone after clone and the, the clone that we take is influenced by the environment that it's in yeah absolutely absolutely good question yeah great question do we have i think maybe do like a couple more do two more return if you last i saw you have you looked into it yet um so this is i did look into it um and this is what uh bacteria eating bacteria i think i looked it up <laughs> I forgot. Um, bacteria Fiji. Oh, jeez. Um, I guess I don't have enough info off the top of my head to really discuss it right now. But um, I did look it up and I kind of forgot. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> have them shoot what it is real quick. Who's ever asking the question, just type it out. Um virus that infects and replicates within bacteria. They make virus that infects and replicates within bacteria. Reduced from canned beets work. I probably wouldn't do that. Um, just me, I mean, are you canning the beets? Are you buying canned beets? Um, what I usually do is I just, um, either grow the beets myself and just blend them up and strain them or run them through like a, like a juicer. Um, uh, and I've tried like the mechanical blade juicer. I've also tried like the, uh, like mastication juicer, you know, like with like the grinder, or whatever, to try to like keep the compounds from being damaged by like a, 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 you know, like a blade of like a blender or whatever. Um, but if you go to the store, you know, I like to like kind of peel my beets, whatever, or just wash them really good because I don't want to have whatever is on the outside of the beets from the store in my in my soil. But I just like blend up beets, strain them, and water them in. Um, has Kevin tested or oh, thought about testing his soil on the hill for what microbes are most abundant? Possible correlation to the plant survival in tougher environments? No, I haven't. But it, it's it's always been in the plan. It's just you know how it goes. We had all these killer plans, but then lo and behold, legal canvas comes in and steals all your money. <laughs> and so yes. now we're back to working off intuition. Right. Again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but no, I'd love to I'd love to be able to do an essay and find out why. It's just it's the same where when we when we do the farm tours with Ganjie, it's all the people that come from out of the area that talk about this profile that they they detect in the area. And we just know that it must be this the, the the population on the hills. And is it so unique just to my hill, or is it like does it does it cover forest? Is it we you know what I mean? Like we what we need is we just need time and, and a research grant. And if you had that, That'd then yeah, no, it would be it would be incredible because then it would really allow you to start to understand, you know, why these places that have produced cannabis at this um, Epicurean level for so long, why are they that? 
what what makes Grass Valley different than Humboldt? What what makes uh, the areas in in um, Northern Oregon or, or you know Southern Oregon so incredible? Like I love growing in Southern Oregon. Oh my god! That's, oh, that's it's, oh right gosh, there. my gosh! Herb loves <laughs> growing there. It's crazy. It's crazy. I love growing in Southern. How the structure of the soil affects the microbial community that can sustain the soil, or how the, I, I feel like there may have been a first part to this question. Oh, about the microbes, but it's, it's it's what type of structure? Because at the end of the day, the, the soil structure would 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 determine what bacteria were present due to either oxygenization or or uh, the, uh, moisture levels, right? So you'd have to have a different population in a loam soil than you would a clay soil. Yeah, or 100%. sand. I mean, you know what I mean, like, but. It, it's the same thing. It's you, you just gotta you just gotta have the money to go spend and dig, and I think that that's the issue. And and it's it's where we you know being able to do it like we're doing right now begins it because someone might be able to 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 do an essay and then post it, and what it does it lets us kind of be able to take a look at their data and say hey this is what we noticed in difference and we can't take that and apply it directly but we can definitely get educated from the pattern. Mm hmm. Hundred percent. Um, maybe one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. Can you talk about terroir and using your on-site resources to accentuate a terp profile? Any good inputs for gaseous strains? Uh, does too much raw, wet hay make your terp profile bland? Okay, we got a few questions. So, um, can we, can we pop that back up for a second, just because yeah. you said um, can you talk about terroir and using on-site resources to accentuate a terp profile? So we kind of like we're touching on this and talking about this throughout the, the conversation, um, like using surrounding plants, either through like fermentation or, you know, maybe you can just soak it in water even or blending and straining and adding it in. Um, but accentuating a specific terp profile, that's going to take some like playing with, right? Like you're going to have to use something and see what kind of comes out of it. Um, and as far as like getting a specific like gas by using a specific thing, I don't know if that's going to be possible. Um, what do you, what do you think about that, Kevin? Yeah, I don't, I don't think you can steer as much as you just, your location is going to determine really what's optimal for you. So for me, like I just happen to be, if, if gas wasn't something that was, was desirable, I'd be screwed because my, that's what my hill accentuates. But what I got from when I was working with, um, uh, uh, Damon from Nomads was that I have so much uh, star thistle that when we harvest all the star thistle from the property, so it's now multiplying, we break that down as a ferment. He was like, "Hey, this stuff is is here. It's native, and it's it's abundant. And if you utilize this as a ferment to utilize, what we've noticed is um, sharper in ter in terms of like flavor profile, odor profile. And so for years, you know, we would go and collect and gather all the star thistle and I would just throw it in 55 gallon barrels and just water from it and break it down yeah. and then, and then utilize it. So I was, I'm just trying to utilize things that are available and abundant because that's the basis of like regenerative agriculture. And I think that if it, the, 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 the environment combined creates that impact. And so you're just going to notice that, hey, is your is your location, if this is outdoor specific, if we're talking mixed light or indoor, you know, you got an unlimited amount of, of control. But for pure outdoor, you're not in control and you, you really have to just say, okay, my hill does this really well. My hill does not do this really well. And then once you're able to sit with that, now you just find what's abundant on your property and utilize it. Because at the end of the day, it's effectively mining and gathering what's there. <laughs> Just like this one. You're effectively mining and gathering what's here. Hello. <laughs> you want to be on screen too? I love you. Hello. All right. <laughs> How are you? That's what my daughter was doing uh, when she woke up from her nap about 45 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. So we, we did the first, but that's, that's terroir. Your terroir is, says that you, you should not grow a Cabernet. If it was wine, they would say, hey, when we looked at the grapes along the fields near you, they all scored higher than you because your grape isn't optimal for your soil index. And so what you, what you need to do is adjust. Yeah. And so 
it, it's it's that specific. What we're doing in in, in cannabis appellations is we're trying to create <laughs> land value. Bless you. We're trying to create land value, but it it doesn't hold true in the same way an appellation would in France or one in Pakistan because the the vine developed in response to that soil there. Right. We don't have anything like that in cannabis here. So we can't ever claim it. But we, what we can say is that our region has an impact on the flower. We culturally are about the flower and that these genes do this on this location. And so that's where, you know, you as a cultivator, you're having to take a look at your property and, and produce. If you can produce the same, produce something that you like, something that, you know, something that you have a good baseline. Do it for two or three years. You don't get to do your whole farm, but just do that same plant a couple of years in a row. And what you're going to find is how does the plant respond to a multi-year cycle of impact? And you'll be able to get a pretty good idea of what does the seasons do to the plant in average. Mm -hmm. And that's going to help you understand really what is your hill. And then now you kind of go, okay, I know that I can't do anything that it's loose structure. Anything that's loose structure on my hill gets beat to death. If it doesn't want to tighten up, it does not do well. If it doesn't have a high wax potential, it doesn't do well. So it limits what I can grow, but it also defines what I grow, which is what the customer wants really at the end of the day is a very clear product that they know that this is what it is every time they buy it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's interesting. And that, that makes me think of like building your own custom soil and then finding like what kind of expression it it really pushes. You know, like if mm -hmm. you're mixing your own blend and then you grow different genetics in it and you find that, you know, you, you're getting better gas from it or whatever. And then following that kind of framework to cultivate that, you know, genetic that your soil composition or your custom we, blend. We, we did that with the company. The uh -huh. company that like when this would have been like, you know, 2014, 2015. That's you know, be, you're, you're leaping into the the beginning of the ideas of legalization. And so a soil company said, hey, we want to build a soil. We want to have you as a tester. And I said, well, check it out. I said, right now, everything's gas. So what we're going to be running is only gas varieties. So what you're really going to be developing, like remember this for your sales, is you're developing a gas-based soil. All the R&D is based off right. of how did it impact fuel. And That's so cool. And so that's what it was. It wasn't, and it was because of, I, I couldn't give them multiple R and D plots because I couldn't sell the other products. Nobody wanted anything but gas. So all the work was fuel based, but the, the soil analysis, the leaf analysis, everything that was being sent back to that company so they could dial it in was mm -hmm. based on the fact that we were producing gas and my hill was a gas hill. So what we would need is like Wendy's operation to say, okay, let's do a fruit. And, and what happens when we optimize for her situation? What happens when we optimize for mine, when we optimize for yours, mm -hmm. you know, like, because like with your cheese, right? So things that have, um, you know, that butyric acid, what, what really makes butyric acid pop? Wow. That's very cool. That's very cool. So you can like, so what, tailor. what made the fuel pop? Oh, I don't know. He, he was making the soil. I just knew that the the soil blend that we were working with and the mineral blend that we would get back from them was ideal. You see, when, when you get into it, like there's a point in your life where you can only go so deep into each topic or you you just don't have time to live your whole life. And so for me, there's things that like I have to be careful. I have a um, kind of obsessive. And so if I get caught up in something, I, I might not let go of it. And so when, when I can work with a company that's doing the development, as long as my results are good and I, it's repeatable and I can work with them, then that's fine. And really it was just them steering their, their mineral levels and the soil levels. And we could determine it ourselves. All you got to do is do a leaf analysis, go to new age, you know, go to new age laboratories and send them a leaf sample and they'll give you your analysis of what's going on at the leaf and then do your soil analysis. And pretty soon you're able to figure out what do you need to add to get to a base and then now you're able to start to say, is that base satisfactory? How do I want to tailor it? Mm -hmm. And it should only take you a year or two. So there's a baseline that you grow the first year, and then it's a matter of just fine tuning it. So over a two, three year period, you really have what you what you've set in motion. But it's the same deal is that the idea that you're 
and it's it's and it's not it's it's everyone has to focus on where they focus and so once you get to a point like for me you, you got enough licenses in your hand you have to be able to say okay i need this accomplished what am i doing how do we get it here but for me to sit there and and comb through that shit it becomes impossible. Otherwise, that's the time you would be playing with your kid. <laughs> that's the time <laughs> you'd be trying to work on your dispensary. So, mm-hmm. like, a lot of it is working with with individuals and allowing them to be able to benefit from the R and D, so that other people can also get that mix. We we want we want to be able to see people benefit. It's everybody wants this proprietary shit, but at the end of the day, you're developing a craft industry and the only way craft industries develop is in sharing the information. You have to be able to get people to be, be part of it because craft isn't about the money as much crafts about the, the identity within the the details. And Mm -hmm. so much of that is the interaction with people. When we add enough money, I don't give a shit Mm -hmm. if I like you or not, but when I have to deal with you with no money, then I have to really deal with you. I want to be able to get a good feeling. And so for me, when, if you work with me, you don't have to go do all the legwork I did to get the info. I'm like, look, you can go do it, but I can just give it to you. And, and it's been thought out and proven. And so just take it and use it. And now you don't need to spend any time on it. And I think that that's really how you have to approach. That's why for me, going into these directions is so fascinating because now that I have more time to really look at it, I can able to say, Hey, what are we doing and how do I do this myself? Yeah. It's important to be open source. I like to share as much information. It's about, you know, growing the quality of the plant and, you know, we lift each other up, right? One person lifts all, one all person day. up, the other one lifts the other one up. You know, yeah, no, it's a, it's day. a community. It's a community. Mm-hmm. And the, the old community was one built off of secrecy because we were all trying to, you know, not get caught. And, and right. now with the, the, you know, the changes in the industry, but the community of people who love cannabis and people who love to grow cannabis and the idea that you can be unique in your production, not just to say you're unique, but because you actually are unique, you actually have a unique impact on the flower or the resin you're producing. And when I get to see all these small craft operators around the world that I bump into that are doing it, I, I'm just, I'm enthralled by it. Because it it's it's been you know lit in motion by all these individuals, and I'm not someone who lit it in motion. I just got lucky that I got to be um, around all the people that did, just like you. I get to be around yeah. you, and so for me, it's just it's it's a it's a it's a gift to be part of a community that's filled with with absolute lunatics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly, I love it. All right, so so we're up on ninety minutes, Kevin. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really enjoyed chatting with you. We had such great talks. Um, uh, so we're going to be doing the show, um, every, every Sunday at 4 20, we'll have different co-hosts on, um, you know, next Sunday is uh, Christmas Eve. The following is New Year's Eve. So we won't be doing it for the next two weeks, but on the seventh, we're going to have Murphy Murray on here. Um, and we're going to be talking about, uh, kind of extraction, uh, type of research. She's going to come up with a research paper. Um, we'll review it. We'll talk about it. Uh, she is a very brilliant woman. If you don't know who Murphy Murray is, look her up. She is a badass. Um, thank yeah, you so much, is. everyone. She's sharp, man. She's real. I, I love her. Her and I will just like nerd out on Instagram, like talking at like one in the morning. It's great. <laughs> I love her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, she's a real one. Yeah. So thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and please join on the 7th. And Luna, thank you. That was a great show. Um, uh, Thanks so much, Peter. The whole, the whole no, audience you did good. That was a wonderful in. show. You, you, you've been oh, having a wonderful you. series. And thank you so much for having me on as a guest. You know, it, it's it's awesome because I'm I'm one of your fans. So uh, I'm it, one it's, of your fans, it's, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what's great. It's great. Yeah. Because we, 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 we're both chasing. We're just chasing what's what's there in our minds. And it it um it's just fun to be around other people that do. So thank you so much. And always thanks to Pete for a, a killer, killer platform. I appreciate you doing the work you do, brother. And I appreciate you giving your time. Yeah, thank you, Peter. So Boom. thank you, everyone. And uh, so, Luna, we will see you in 2024. Sounds good. Awesome. Happy <laughs> holidays. Happy Bye. Bye.